All right, everyone, welcome to the podcast. In today's episode, my guest is Gemma Green. So first and foremost, she's a fellow Aussie, but also she's the CEO and co-founder of Powerledger, an Australian-based company building a software platform to democratize the demand and supply of electricity using the blockchain. What they're doing here is pretty game-changing. Basically, what this means is that they are trying to empower consumers like you and me to be able to pick and choose where we get our power from for our homes, but at the same time, it allows others to produce their own power from solar panels for on their roofs and provide that power back to the grid. So this was such an interesting conversation with Gemma, where you sort of get to understand where we are now in terms of how we get and consume our traditional power, but we also can potentially go with power generation and distribution in the future. If you're the sort of person who enjoys learning about blockchain, renewable energy, or just interested in finding out more about how electricity generation works, then I think this episode is just for you. So without further ado, Please sit back and enjoy my conversation with Gemma Green. Gemma, thank you so much for joining the uh, the podcast. I really appreciate it. You know, I just want to, you know, hopefully just to get to understand exactly what Power Ledger is all about. And I know that we will get into that um, at some point, um, but I know that something that I was thinking about a couple of days ago was with regards to the pandemic, right? And it seems to me a lot of people are working from home now. And it just struck me that, you know, with people working from home, I think a lot of people are starting to use a lot more energy as well, you know, uh, you know, from household to household. And I was wondering, has that sort of uh, impacted the, the way that you guys are thinking about Power Ledger? Um, because it feels like, the energy stuff and and what you guys are involved in uh, really does have an impact on on the way um, things have transpired over this past year. I think that this it, it ha- what the pandemic has done has you know, made things happen that were right for change, and you know, we were moving towards um, more flexible ways of working but i think this has been you know precipitated many companies actually embracing it you know at a much greater level than they would have done otherwise and what that the significance of that for electricity is that the the historic like consumption profiles for offices probably will look different to what it will do in the near term and the household consumption profiles will look different um I mean, that, that will have an impact on the grid, uh, you know, in terms of forecasting needs and what beyond the pandemic, what the new norm will look like. Um, I think that, they, that the predictions will be, um, will, will be quite different to what is borne out in reality. So in terms of, you know, implications for the business, I, I mean, what Howard is focused on is localised energy markets. So it's actually looking using price signals to solve localized needs and challenges in discrete parts of the grid. So to the extent that a issue arises in a new part of the grid, you know, a market mechanism can be used uh, to encourage the right kind of um, behavior, be it installing a battery or um, you know load shifting or um, a curtailment, whatever the um, the service is to actually deal with like the balancing of local um, needs in a particular part of the grid. So I think that um, that historically it's been very predictable and known, you know, centralised generation and, and demand for electricity. And as you have these more complex and less predictable situations occur, you need something that is far more um, bespoke, dynamic, and um, you know, and context specific. So I think that the long and short of it is that you know our platform would be able to assist with these more um, or rather less predictable situations. Um, okay, so that, I think that was like a lot of information, and I think this is stuff that I really want to get into um, down the road. But for the listeners who are not aware of what Powerledge is or even who you are. Do you want to just give a quick bio about um, 
you know, how you got started and what Power Ledger is actually trying to do. Certainly. Uh, I mean, we're a software company. We use the blockchain to facilitate the trading of energy, the trading of flexibilities and the trading of renewable energy certificates all peer to peer. And um, we are about four and a half years old. We have about 20 projects in 10 countries. And they range from like looking at the, these different um, th- topics that I mentioned, energy trading, flexibilities trading and renewable energy certificate trading. So energy trading is like peer-to-peer trading of solar, um, uh, you know, household to household or from business to household or household to business. So if households with surplus solar could sell to a corporate that has pledged to buy their energy from renewables and pay them in store product or vouchers, for example. Um, So that's one example of it. And flexibilities trading is really using batteries to um, uh, provide services to the grid. So that's on command uh, based on the need that exists in the market. And that could include like um, arbitraging the spot market or what's called the FCAS market or frequency control ancillary service markets or um, network services. There's different things that batteries can do for different, like for retailers or for the grid. Um, And so a battery can be used, provide income for um, a household that invests in it or a business that invests in a battery beyond providing its own electricity needs. Um, And then the third is renewable energy certificates. And a renewable energy certificate is a measurement of one megawatt hour of renewable electricity. And uh, that certificate can be used uh, to match against the amount of energy like a business um, uses so that they're able to accurately claim that they are 100% renewable or, you know, percentage of their energy consumption is derived from renewable sources. Because once energy is pushed into like a wholesale market, you can't actually tag that unit of energy. So the way we that's dealt with in the system is that for any megawatt hour consumed, if you add a certificate that um, uh, measures the environmental attributes of the output of a renewable energy asset, you can validly claim it's renewable. Uh, and uh, many corporates now are starting to buy certificates, not just from anywhere at any time, but actually matched against their load profile. So if they consume electricity in Sydney at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday, they buy a certificate that was generated in Sydney at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday. Um, and what that means is that they can put a signal into the market to build renewable assets when and where they're needed as opposed to building it anywhere at any time, which is causing problems on the grid. So what's happened in the past sort of 10 or 20 years is lots of energy has been installed not where it's needed, not where it's when it's needed, and that's causing grid instability, things like reverse flows, voltage and reactive power issues, and things that you might have heard of called the duck curve. Um, and really... This was all stimulated by a lot of subsidies around renewables. So we got a lot built, but it, it, and it's not just in Australia. This is in other countries like Germany and Japan and California that have high penetrations of renewables. And we'll be seen in other countries if they don't get the price signals right. If they just subsidise renewables and there's no discrete price signal, it's going to cause these problems in the grid, which everyone will ultimately be paying for and it pushes up the prices. And our thesis is that if you put the price signals in to get energy produced when and where it's needed, you're not going to cause these perverse issues in the grid um, and it will become a, a lower cost, uh, cleaner and more stable system. So our software is really designed to look at um, all aspects of like the energy system and create like an operating system for new energy markets. Right, okay. So and it seems to me this is like a, a new playing field that... Uh, not a lot of companies are exploring right now. And I think Power Ledger is just maybe a handful of those uh, participants in the market. And, you know, it's, it seems to me that you are trying to efficiently allocate the distribution of energy um, using this operating system. And, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of inefficiencies at the moment in the way that classically that uh, power distribution, power plants, and power generation is generally created nowadays. And especially when it comes to Australia and and sort of just developed nations, you know, was the, um, was this the impetus, I suppose, to 
really kickstart Power Ledger because I find that you know this is a very complex project in and of itself. So I'm trying to understand um, how did you come about this idea in the first place to even actually get this started. Uh, so there were a few things that kind of coalesced to result in like Power Ledger being created. Uh, one of them was I was doing a PhD looking at electricity market disruption and I designed a solar and battery system for an apartment building and I was trying to find software that could facilitate the trading of electricity within that microgrid and I couldn't find anything that did that and by chance a former banking colleague of mine had introduced me to two blockchain people in Perth uh, and they were explaining the use cases for the blockchain and that it could have application for electricity. And I put them in touch with uh, Dave Martin, one of my fellow co-founders, and he'd worked in electricity network businesses for more than two decades and saw that the technology could be used for trading of electricity across the grid. Uh, and he said, I want to set up a company. Do you want to join me? And I said, yes. Uh, and that it was, so it was kind of like a you know, serendipitous set of circumstances that led to the creation of Power Ledger because of the insights that we were having about our work. Um, and uh, that was in 2016. In 2017, we wrote a white paper articulating the platform and its various features, which covers off those topics, those three topics that I just shared with you. Uh, and certainly efficiency was the driving thought behind all of it, you know, to, to respond to your question. Uh, we, we could see that because the wrong signals were being put in the market, lots of things were happening which were just not good. So in Germany, for example, McKinsey published a report called um, Germany Energy at a Crossroads last year, which shows that so much generation is happening in the north, whereas the consumption's in the south. So then you have to build a lot of transmission lines to move that electricity to the market where it's going to be consumed, and that's expensive. So Germany has the most expensive electricity in the world and is failing uh, on stability uh, factors and even climate. They're actually not, even though they've done a lot of that, because the system's not efficient, they're actually having to pull in energy from uh, many like carbon intensive sources to um, provide the system stability that they need. Um, so I think that, you know, we had a tariff era for the better part of 10 or 15 years where feed in tariffs resulted in lots of new generation coming online from rooftop solar. And that, you know, created the duck curve. It was so wildly successful beyond anything that anyone had predicted. And now we're, we're moving out of that era. Most of the feed-in tariffs are going to uh, have been signaled to retire, the subsidised ones. So we're moving into a market mechanism era. And now corporate PPAs are a way that businesses that have pledged sustainability commitments are procuring their energy. And there's a big boom in that area. Um, and they're matching their, obviously, PPA purchasing against their load profile. But I think there's a trend towards being more specific and granular. I don't want to just know that it's renewable. I actually would like to understand where it's coming from. So we've got a retail partner in France called Equateur who have about 250,000 customers, and they've grown that in a short space of time based on the premise of customers want to actually know where their energy is coming from, like provenance. And the blockchain obviously lends itself very naturally to tracking the output of energy uh, from source. And so customers using our platform and Equateur will be able to choose their own energy mix so they can specify, I want 20% solar from this particular farm or 15% wind from this particular farm. Uh, uh, and, uh, and with corporates, I think you've got a similar trend where they're actually not just wanting to be able to say renewables, but they want to be able to say this solar farm or um, we're matching our, our purchasing of renewables, be it from energy or certificates against our load profile to deliver a grid that works for everybody. Um, and Google has really set the, the, the tone for that conversation with their um, recent public pledges and reports. So they've got like a global map of the world with a circle in each region of a 24-hour clock showing how much energy is coming from renewable sources at different times of the day versus other sources. And they've got obviously a commitment to get to 100%. And you can see the next tier of corporate leaders starting to contemplate how they might do that, perhaps without Google's analytics behind them and platforms like ours can assist. So I think that there is a, we've been talking about renewables for so long that everyone thinks that we should just have them. 
but m- many people don't realise that, you know, certificates might be coming from other countries and not actually in the market you're operating from. So you're not actually putting a price signal in your local market to get the energy system of the future that is needed. Uh, and I think it's a bit like what happened with Nike in the 1990s when they offshored their sneaker production to Pakistan and at the time they didn't really care about their supply chain but and they didn't get mattered. But their customers said otherwise and started to boycott them and it was a you know an awakening for them in looking at the provenance of uh, their supply chain. And I think people probably don't care if it's renewables or not, but they care if they're being told it's renewables to find that it's not. Um, so I think that um, this this discontent is going to drive like another way of having more accountability around claims around renewables, um, not just, you know, can I do it legally, but like what's the standard that I'm operating to? And there's a big spectrum on that on that front. So I, I think that this is going to, this de- demand-led um, uh, and expectations of brands that are making claims to have more integrity around the, the way that they go about doing that. Yeah, you mentioned about the blockchain and that's obviously a, a you know a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff happening around the blockchain at the moment and I want to unravel that a little bit but it seems to me that the platform that you guys are developing is not just trying to identify the source of truth in terms of where the energy comes from much like what you know, a transactional um, um, what the blockchain actually supports when you can actually have a distributed ledger you can use that ledger to identify um, the participants in that transaction and verify the validity of that transaction but at the same time you're using your developing operating system so you can create more like an energy trading platform at the same time um, and I want to sort of dig that dig deeper into that later on but before we get into that, just explain to me, what is the duck curve? Oh, the duck curve is like a, a graph that shows uh, how consumption during the day is lower and that's when solar is generating electricity and consumption at night is higher and then there's not a lot of energy. So it's a kind of mismatch. Uh, and so it looks like the shape of a duck on a graph and uh, this is a manifestation of you know, a market signal that's delivered energy, what, not where it's needed, not when it's needed. And that, it sounds like, a, you know, a cute thing, but it's actually a very problematic thing for networks, for grids, to deal with um, the reverse flows of electricity uh, causes many issues around, I think I said earlier, voltage, reactive power, and um, uh, issues around f- like phase management. So, it's very costly and uh, it needs to be dealt with. So the networks are now beginning to run flexibilities markets to encourage that electricity during the day to either be consumed, so a battery might um, store it or a a business might ramp up their operations to consume it or um, the solar plant might be paid to curtail or stop producing that electricity so it doesn't get generated at all. So it's going to be one of those three things uh, and we're, we'll start to see more and more of these things manifest in Europe, the US and Australia, the rule changes um, that have been signalled like in the US for 2222 and in Australia there's new network uh, requirements for if they're going to spend money on upgrading the network, which they would otherwise have to do to deal with that duck curve, instead to look at creating a flexibilities market to pay um, pay the market to either store, uh, consume or avoid production of that energy. Um, as So those two things, uh, uh, augmenting the network will be compared against those flex markets and see what is, you know, a lower cost alternative. Uh, so the duck curve is uh, something that you see in all the markets with a high penetration of renewables and is likely to be seen in markets that want to grow their renewables generation base unless they start to put more sophisticated price signals in to deal with it in advance. Got it. Okay. So it sounds like to me that, you know, there is definitely, you know, as we, and I think inefficiency really plays a huge role in what you guys are trying to curb 
right now. And it seems to me that there's a lot of interest in what you guys are doing. Um, and you mentioned a few use cases, especially like those guys in France, in California. There was an article written about a partnership that you guys struck um, as well. And it seems that there's a lot of interest, especially when it comes to solar generation and solar distribution. Um, so I'm trying to understand because, you know, explaining to people what Power Ledger does um, is not something that you can quickly uh, quickly chat about um, on, on a round of coffee. So I want to just maybe boil this down to the very simple um, thing of, you know, you're an, you're an operating system, you're a platform, which is a software service. But let's take us as a use case myself, right? And, you know, I have a house. And how does Palliger play into the infrastructure of the way that I consume electricity? Do I, as the consumer, even get exposed to what you guys are doing? Or is that abstracted away from my energy provider? Because, you know, for me, as you said, you know, the consumer is really, um, now nowadays, I think people are more cognizant about, you know, where their energy comes from. Um, and they want to be be able to pick and choose. But in when it comes to the software platform you're developing, how do I, as a user, um, interact with that? So uh, you, via one of our partner retailers, you could um, like sell your surplus solar if you have solar on your roof to like a corporate and provide their energy. Um, or if you have a battery, you could trade it as a virtual power plant. So you could provide battery sourced electricity to your retailer uh, and pay back your investment in a battery faster and the retailer can buy your battery sourced energy as an alternative to procuring those services in the wholesale market or you could sell your battery sourced energy to the grid to the network operator to help them stabilize the grid as an alternative to them uh, augmenting the network like upgrading the physical poles and wires and pay back your investment in a battery faster um, so there, some there's three different ways, like via either um, an aggregator aggregating your solar and battery energy to trade, or via a retailer aggregating that to trade using our platform to measure the output of your systems against the actual consumption of the buyer, um, and we can coordinate the activity of your battery via APIs connect, connecting to inverters on what's called the demand response layer. So there's that and we can you can set your system to trade based on, you know, your your own desires or requirements or have it to set and forget to optimize income. So you don't have if you want to gamify it, you can, or if you just want to set and forget it, you can. So and then like in the US, the rule changes that have been announced in September will result in um uh en renewable energy like from households being able to aggregate and participate in wholesale markets in the next year which is really exciting and in the UK you're actually seeing quite an interesting innovation where every household and their meter could have multiple retailers so you might have one for the supply of your household electricity one for your virtual power plant one for your EV charging for example um, and then in Australia the 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 changes that are being signaled are called two-sided markets which will allow you know both buyers and sellers to trade uh, both ways. However, in Australia, you can already do virtual power plant trading without any rule changes and flex trading is actually um, able to be done already. So there's already quite a lot here. Um, and in Europe, there's a directive called the Clean Energy Package, um, which would be doing a similar thing. So basically, it's it'll be either via an aggregator or a retailer, you can sign up for those services and then you can like connect your solar in the battery system and set and set it up how you want. And I mean, using the black blockchain, what that facilitates is more scalability. So, um, uh, you know, m manual operations are often required to perform transactions with counterparties with non-blockchain solutions. And I think that limits their scalability or the cost to scale. And so, uh, and then... Uh, using the blockchain you can facilitate um, multiple networks so cross retailer trading or your battery could be used to supply a retailer and a network operator as well and um, 
I think this isn't possible with without the rigors of a blockchain system, which means that um, you can access a large number of nodes and it could therefore bring you know, a more responsive degree of stability to the network and more income earning opportunities for the battery. And the other thing with the blockchain, obviously, is it's tamper proof. And um, uh, I think while, you know, the individual amounts transacted aren't massive over a year and across geography, you know, they amount to significant amounts of money and people want to know that that is accurate. Moreover, you know, in the era of, you know, when every corporate has a, D, you know, DDoS attack and opened up consumer credit card data being, you know, being tamper proof is, you know, more or less, you know, a table stake of modern tech businesses. So, um, and I think beyond, you know, criminal actors, you know, there's also state sponsored bad actors to consider and ensure that security here will, you know, become increasingly important. And the final thing is like around the settlement, it's, you know, really immediate and automatic. So you can um, use the blockchain to facilitate faster settlement, both in terms of um, accrual, um, using smart meters to accrue debits in people's system, but also daily settlement off the back of that as well. So I think um, it's, um, I think there's many benefits to create a more efficient system for the distributed energy market. And what our platform is, is like a toolbox. So energy retailers or network businesses can dial up or dial down the amount of disruption they want to embrace and they can use the platform features to facilitate that to the extent that they want to. Got it. So it, it sounds like there is, you know, you've got the sort of the business to business uh, phase of Power Ledger and what you guys do, but you also have a business to consumer as well because if you guys, if I have solar panels on my roof and I want to harvest that energy and, you know, I might have a surplus of energy, so I might be able to give that energy back into the grid, then in that scenario, um, I can make money, number one, and number two, I can uh, provide that surplus energy to other users who are demanding that in in that on that grid, right? So does that does that make sense? Yeah, I mean it does. So I mean it's like you know many retail brands don't sell direct to their customers. You know they sell yeah. to stores and shops who then do that. In our case, yeah. uh, you know we sell to retailers and network businesses who on sell and provide that use our platform to provide services to their customers um, and we can do that white label with their own branding or including us and use our front end so there's like options for how they might actually functionally do that but um, I think that the the work that we're doing that you know there's a fair amount of recognition and understanding around our brand and what it provides so it might be that, you know, our clients want to utilize that as a part of their marketing of these new services that they're providing their customers. Got it. Got it. You now let's like I wanna sort of switch gears a little bit and, and focus a lot a bit more about on the blockchain because you know that is a huge, huge component of what you guys are trying to build on top of. And right now, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's all the rage right now. And um I want people to just understand a little bit about why blockchain is so powerful. And you've mentioned a few examples already where blockchain can provide value and advantages when it comes to security, it comes to distributed uh, distribution, transactions, and so on and so forth. Do you want to uh, just sort of enlighten me with a little bit about the background on what blockchain you are using um, and what is sort of the currency you're using on top of that blockchain and is it similar to what is already out there or are you guys deciding to build your own thing okay great thanks so i mean blockchain is kind of talked about like the star of the show but it's really not it's kind of like you know barcodes in a supermarket they they don't um make the supermarket they don't define the supermarket experience but they just make everything more efficient and scalable so you can go to your local corner store and buy milk or you can go to the supermarket and buy milk and by virtue of the fact that they have barcodes there, you know, there's a lot more choice. The way you're processed through that system is more efficient. They restock the shelves more automatically so that, um, you know, the product is there when you want. So it, it doesn't define the, 
the supermarket user experience. It's sort of sitting in the background and it provides something. And I think that um, that's an important um, distinction because it's often talked about like, you know, front and centre. And I, I actually think that it, it's more in the background um, like that. And, you know, uh, one of the issues that often raised is why blockchain? You know, why have such a new piece of technology at the heart of a new system when, you know, you can conceivably do without it? And I think it's a good question and demands a thorough answer. And um, I, I think that the four things that I mentioned before around scalability, um, you know, uh, multiple network access, tamper-proof, and the settlement can be immediate and automatic are four reasons why. And, um, you know, some people might go, well, that, you know, it's overkill or it's not needed. It's not more expensive. So why wouldn't you, like, get a better quality system, you know, to record things and reduce the risk of incidents? So it's really um, uh, a more efficient system uh, from, you know, many reasons. Uh, in terms of how what blockchains we use and how we structure um, access to the platform. So um, to, to normally software licenses, you pay your licensing fee to the company and you never see that money again. Whereas what we have is we created a, a cryptocurrency, a digital token called the Power Token, which um, clients can pay for access to the software using the Power Token. And then they, they need a certain amount of that based on how big their trading environment is. So the bigger it is, the more Power Tokens they need. And then those Power Tokens get put in escrow or in a bond while the client is using the platform and then if they stop using the platform they actually get the power tokens back um, so they're in sense, they can also pay for software license to us like conventionally with dollars and not get the money back or they can pay in power and and have the upside so they share in the benefit of the more people and clients that are using the you know system the more likely that that um, power token is to appreciate in value uh, and so they get to benefit from you know the use of the power ledger system uh, in you know more ways than one and so we've incentivized the use of the power token uh, in that respect we also have another token called the spark which is a cryptographic token and uh, that's not a cryptocurrency so what that is is like a accounting record that measures the actual amount of energy uh, in dollar terms so Sparks are denominated in the local currency. So in Japan, one spark is one yen. In the US, one spark is one cent. And it's just contained within a particular trading environment. So you can't send sparks from Australia to Japan. Um, and uh, uh, that is basically the recording system it, in, that sits in the background. And if you want to create a prepaid trading environment, the sparks actually represent um, prepayment. So I might buy it $10 worth of electricity and prepay that in Sparks and then I send that to the seller who receives it and then they can convert those Sparks into dollars into their bank account and we need a certain amount of power to underwrite the risk from prepayment of those Sparks on the system. So in the event that the utility doesn't honour the prepayment, like I could get a refund on that prepayment, the power sits as an escrow bond to um, cover some of the risk associated with them not settling up. The bill at the end so you can do post pay or prepay and we have like designed the system both ways um, obviously most of the market is post pay but there's actually a lot of interest in creating prepaid environments to reduce counterparty and settlement risk so that's something that we also offer uh, and in terms of blockchain power token sits on the ethereum blockchain at uh, sparks sit on a consortium in-house blockchain that we have developed uh, but we're also developing, and, and the Ethereum blockchain is fine for the level of scale that we have at the moment, but longer term, another solution is required to deal with the needs of electricity markets. So we're actually developing um, a, a new blockchain for that purpose, and we'll be launching details of that pretty soon. Um, but it's one that's really designed with, you know, the electricity use case for distributed energy markets and new energy markets. Um, for fast block time, um, you know, super high security, people can provide access to their um, energy use data to the extent that they want to, not dissimilar to medical records, um, you know, use cases in blockchain. Um, and so, yeah, we're really excited having worked in the market now for several years to understand more deeply what are the requirements and develop something that's so fit for purpose. I want to, um, I, I think that's really fascinating because, you know, you you mentioned about how 
you know, blockchain isn't really the central star of the show, and which makes sense because, you know, blockchain is just really a tool that you can use in order to perform these sort of transactions. But at the same time, it does provide all of this benefit, and it's basically um, something that is undergoing a lot of research and development at the moment, not just in Palagid, but all around the world with respect to a lot of other applications as well. And I want to sort of understand with the, the tokens that you described, you know, you have the, the power token and then the spark token um, on different blockchains, right? If I was a, uh, a user and I was participating in the network, how would I acquire a power token in the first place? Well, um, you can, it's traded in the secondary market on about a dozen exchanges. So anyone can purchase power tokens um, on many digital currency exchanges. So I think that, and that sort of leads me to my next question, because now what you've opened up as a company is an entire industry of a financial, it's the financial industry, right? So it's not just like energy um, per se, I'm, I'm consuming and I'm demanding and supplying energy, but now you can um, impose certain, um, I don't know, rules and and frameworks around the trading of energy like a stock market. So does was that part of the design or um, being able to transact these power tokens, um, or, and, and or is that, or does that sort of supplement the the work that you're trying to do? Well, energy markets operate, you know, you know they're like publicly traded, um, you know, capital markets like uh, energy markets, frequency control, ancillary service markets, capacity markets. You know, there's sophisticated players providing liquidity to those and um, trading traders that are not actual buyers, but are you know trading the price differentials and the volatility in the market. So that's been going on, you know, for a long time. Uh, what we're doing is, um, you know, turning it from a one-sided market into a two-sided market where um, households and businesses can actually be remunerated for the value that they provide to the overarching system um, rather than, you know, just be, you know, passive recipients of a flat tariff. Um, so it's really using the blockchain to connect lots of users to a market in a very cost-effective way um, so that they can get price signals and change their behaviour or invest in things like, you know, um, smart devices in their house, EVs, batteries, solar systems, and um, for those things to pay themselves off as fast as possible and, um, you know, in, in, inform the business case for them making those capital investments in the first place. You mentioned renewables extensively at the beginning as well of the conversation, and a lot of the the stuff that you're working on depends on the renewables. But I, I want to understand a little bit about what is the renewable market like in Australia right now. Um, I know that in California we are moving towards a more greener initiative. Um, there are particular parts of Europe as well, and you know with the I'm just trying to understand what is your perspective on the roadmap of where you think this will go in terms of renewables? Because do you see every household being able to participate, or are these only is it only exclusive to um, certain parties that can join the network? Well, people without solar panels can um, access renewable energy either via, you know via their retailer with a tariff or with using our platform and a partner retailer can do that, like buy renewable energy from their neighbours. If they're renting, they can still access renewable energy or if they're in an apartment building renting, um, they could purchase it from the rooftop um, of that building uh, and the, the landlord is incentivized to put solar in because they actually get an additional income stream from a household. Um, so the idea is that it's an energy system that works for everyone and that you know everyone has, can act, have access to low-cost, clean and stable energy. Um, you know, there's you know 1.3 billion people in the world who don't have access to energy at all, and they live in energy poverty. And then there's a lot of people that are marginalised in society because they don't understand, um, you know, well they they can't access renewables and and get derived lower cost energy, and they um, haven't been. I think there's a bit of a feeling, uh, consumers are disengaged and they don't want to know, but. 
um, you know, you can't discount the digital era and the level of engagement that has existed in a lot of different sectors. And um, I, I don't actually agree with that sentiment. And if you look at some of the new entrants in electricity markets that are providing really compelling ways of engaging, there's high levels of engagement. So as an example, in New Zealand, there's a company called Kiwi Electric that offer um, this thing called the free hour of power. So any day you can choose which hour in the day you want a free hour of off-peak power and you can do it up until 11 or 12 o'clock that night. So if you log onto the system, it shows every hour in the day how much energy you've used in that hour and you can pick. And as a result of that, 80% of their customers log on um, every month and normal, and I think on average eight or nine times a month. Um, so that, you know, succinct way of presenting that information to them has created a very high level of engagement that didn't otherwise exist. And I think that the new guard of, you know, energy suppliers are going to start to do that and attract customers and retain customers by, by doing so. And our platform is a way that they can do more complex things in very simple ways uh, and encourage the right behaviour and, you know, drive better outcomes for everybody. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, definitely... I guess this new generation of people would love to, they love data. And it seems to me that, you know, whether it be data about their health, um, data about uh, their energy consumption, because over here in California, we use our, our electricity provider is uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. And on their website, you can log in every month and you can analyze the energy you're consuming you can, and also you can also compare how your household is comparing to other households who are supposedly energy efficient, and you can identify salient points of okay, maybe that was because it was colder. I turned on the heater. Um, it was Christmas, and I started to cook food and using the ovens and appliances. So I feel that has given me at least a bit more insight into exactly what I'm doing and also obviously being a bit more cognizant about um, how I consume energy and I feel like you know this new age of um, supply demand of energy and distribution is just going to add on top of that especially what you guys are doing and you know I I, I guess I want to understand a little bit about the roadmap now you know for you guys you are in I think it was like 10 projects, I suppose, that you're participating at the moment. What is sort of the the next roadmap for you guys in the next, I don't know, two to three years? Where, where, where do you see yourselves? Yeah, so um, I think the focus is uh, around virtual power plant trading, firstly in Australia, um, and to get households on to our system uh, next year. And uh, then also loyalty, peer-to-peer -peer trading of electricity, so corporate sustainability leader brands buying solar from households and paying them in store products and credits, and then also renewable energy certificate trading matched against low profile and then the flex market, so those batteries also providing services to the network businesses. So I think they're the focus areas and, uh, you know, we're starting to put people on the ground in market in the US and Europe recognising the changing regulatory landscape to create bigger market opportunities for us. Um, and so it makes sense to be servicing them locally in market. And uh, I think next, you know, the signals from the market like this year have been very exciting. And I think that 2021 and 2022 are going to be very significant seismic shifts in what happens in the market and how people will be seeing not only renewables as part of the problem, but also how they can be used to um, you know, create the solutions. And I, I, I mean, I'm definitely a big advocate of renewables, but I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an acolyte. I think we need a system that works. And a lot of people think that, you know, oh, we should just get to 100% renewables at all costs. But I don't ascribe to that view. I think that in, it depends on the resources you've got in a particular country. But if you take Australia, for example, uh, we don't have a lot of storage, um, you know, hydro storage, so therefore, you're going to need a lot of batteries um, to cover seasonal intermittency, and it doesn't make economic sense to do that. So that means that you're going to need a gas solution, whether it be conventional gas or biogas, and also to look at more hydro. And so it might be that we um, have a, 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 com a hybrid system, and I think for us it's about a system that works for everybody 
and renewables can be can grow in a scalable way without causing the problems in the grid and uh, you know market mechanisms can be used to get the right outcomes for um, you know incumbent players as well as the new market entrants right right and you know I can definitely see that there's going to be a an exponential growth in not just the energy consumption but also the trying to figure out the distribution of um, the efficient distribution of energy, I suppose, in these markets, right? And obviously, you mentioned that there's a huge disparity between those who can, who are, who have um, access to energy, and those who don't. The energy poverty, as you will, right? Just explain a little bit about that, because you know, I am, I'm shocked because when you look at the numbers and you you see how many people don't have access. Not just to internet. In, uh, access to internet is one thing, but access to energy, just like you know, plain and simple electricity, is um, you know not you don't you would think that everyone has that basic access, but they don't. So you know, does what are the, some of the challenges there with, with regards to how do we make sure that everyone, or at least a, a good proportion of the population, um, have access to energy? Uh, well, I mean, if you don't have electricity, you, you can't like you know refrigerate medicine. <laughs> so your health um, prospects are compromised. Your the ability for you to sustain yourself economically is compromised as well. So having electricity opens up a whole realm of opportunities in developing countries and rural areas in terms of um, development of you know industry and job prospects and things like that. So it's it's fundamental. To improving, you know, health prospects and economic prospects, and uh, you know, standard of living. So I think it's something, you know, if you look at the sustainable development goals, to achieve those requires electricity and you know, water and sanitation as well as a kind of precondition to manifest a lot of those things. And um, you know, if you want to develop electricity sustainably, it needs to come from low carbon sources, and you know, invariably, it's going to have a renewable component to that. So. Uh, I think that I think that's fairly well understood in terms of um, like the multilaterals. You can see now that they like you know institutions like the World Bank and the IFC are no longer funding coal-fired power stations to assist developing countries get you know electrification uh, infrastructure underway. Um, so that they're now looking at other things because also you've got the operating costs for these assets, and if they don't have those fuels in market. They're importing them, and often they're priced in, you know, other currencies, and it creates a lot of, uh, you know, FX exposure to those countries, and can be a huge economic burden. So having things that it's not just the upfront capital cost, but the ongoing costs be manageable, I think, is an important consideration that the multilaterals are now looking at, in addition to concerns around clean air and climate. Got it. Yeah, and and uh, it seems to me that there is. A lot of push for this, and a lot of regulations and regulatory actions that need to be taken in order to make sure that something like this happens. And I think a lot of the, uh, I guess, the governments around the world are looking towards um, sort of you know that deregulation, but also trying to um, incentivize a lot of the private sector, like you guys, to really be innovative and. Um, think about of uh, think about solutions that can uh, really help um, you know democratize energy in that respect, right? I wanted to maybe do another pivot a little bit and just focus on how you got into this because you not you can't just wake up every day, one day and say hey you know I'm just gonna I'm gonna start Power Ledger um, and trying to to build a system that I'm building right now, but I want to understand about the motivations you had when it came to sort of, you know, you mentioned about the particular folks that you interacted with um, who sort of gave you this idea and you sort of joined on board. But was it something that you were looking to start something for yourself or was this for, as you said before, was it just serendipity? Uh, well, I mean, prior to Power Ledger, I lived in the UK for 11 years and worked in investment banking and I decided to move home to Australia, to Perth, where I'm from, and there's no investment banks there. So I needed to choose something else to do. Right. And yeah. then I decided to do the PhD looking at electricity markets. And uh, so there was a kind of, you know, sequence of events 
But in terms of like the power ledger, you know, it was the co-founders collectively that came up with the idea and, you know, and um, Dave Martin actually, you know, decided to set up the company in the first place. So, and I think, you know, we, we collectively articulated the mission around the democratisation of power and, and something that we all got, you know, really excited about. Um, so, and, you know, it really resonated with us and made us want to kind of get out of bed every morning and do lots of podcasts and, you know, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about what we're doing and attract interest and attention because, you know, we really believe this is something that uh, is important and can add a lot of value and, and the inroads that we've made to date are, you know, great um, pulse checks for um, the appetite that is growing and emerging in, in this space. So, you know, we are very optimistic about the the potential and the impact that the technology can have for our energy system and for society. What is the, um, what is like the tech industry like in sort of Perth right now? I mean, when you guys started out, what was the, I, I, did you guys sort of bootstrap yourselves and, you know, use the, the money that you had, or did you guys actively seek funding and investment to get this idea off the ground? Yeah, I think we bootstrapped the company for, you know, more than a year uh, before we like got investors in, our first investors in. Uh, and, um, yeah, we, we operated very leanly from, you know, people's houses. Uh, eventually we got an office um, about one and a half years into setting up the company. We ran an initial coin offering, which we issued the power, and that provided us with, um, you know, a really good amount of capital to run our operations and build out the platform using the trials that we've been doing to refine the platform and make it the operating system for new energy markets. And um, since then we haven't had the need to you know, raise more money in the market, although, you know, one day that's something we might contemplate to add speed to scale. So, but yeah, it's been a kind of unconventional path, I think, than what a normal startup would be. And in terms of the Perth market, it's fairly small and nascent, but there's some, you know, there's some players here that are doing really innovative things like Canva actually, you know, is a uh, founded by, you know, two people from Perth um, and there's more kind of capital and investment uh, funding new enterprise here and there's different like accelerator programs so that young entrepreneurs can get involved and find out how to. So mm-hmm. I, I, I'm quite hopeful that the ecosystem will, um, you know, build out over time and hopefully uh, for me, like someone with three kids, I would like those kind of exciting opportunities to exist here in Perth so that they don't have to go and spend 11 years in London like I did. Um, so it'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. I completely agree. And I think it's, it's, the landscape is changing. And, you know, I speak to friends all of the time back in Sydney, where I'm initially from. And I think there is a lot more innovative stuff happening um, in different parts of the country. And it's slowly but surely you can definitely see a sort of a, a ramp up in um, startup jobs and funding and investment. And, you know, it's good to see that there's an ecosystem like that that can sort of harvest a lot of the uh, intellectual minds in that area. Um, and I think for the most part, it's good to know that at least companies like you guys do exist in Australia and you guys can hopefully pave the way for a lot of other companies, not necessarily in blockchain or in power, but just companies in general to do disruptive things. And I think that's a a really important role to play, especially in that market. Um, And, you know, I just want to just to finalize uh, a couple of other things because I know we're sort of hitting the hour mark here, but I really want to, and I'll put this in the description below, you are a contributing to editor to Forbes. And I just wanted to understand a little bit about your role there because you have a multi-part series of articles that you've written. And um, and I want people to sort of read those articles when they have the chance, but just explain in a nutshell, what is the purpose of those articles and what are you trying to showcase in, in what you write? Uh, so I, uh, I write about like blockchain uh, and energy and just blockchain in general, uh, but I most recently have made like a seven-part multi 
part system, which is really focused on like the road to a new energy system uh, and looking at like con conflicts around fundamental issues of energy, although they might feel new, they're not. And I think they just underline how difficult, uh, you know, an energy transition can be. And uh, I really wanted to take an in-depth look at the first energy revolution, which was the move from um, slave um, and muscle power to steam and uh, to, to link that to the present day debate around renewables and the new concepts that exist and the path towards a new distributed grid. So um, there's seven parts to that. Um, uh, the first one is called from muscle power to steam power and then the most seventh one is called how electricity depends on swaps, cats, collars and futures. Um, and I think I'll, I'll write a couple more around PPAs and flexibilities markets in the next couple of weeks. But I think it, it I wrote them because I couldn't find anywhere that actually captured the whole sentiment of what's happening in the energy market, the, the, the transition. There are people that are, have expertise in one bit or another, but I didn't. I couldn't find a synthesis piece. And so I wanted just to write something that kind of captured that. Um, and uh, thanks for mentioning it, Barry. So I'm not actually an editor. I'm a contributor. Sorry, contributor. Uh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, to correct the record. Um, but one day. Uh, anyway, but I, I would love if anyone wants to read them uh, to give me some feedback on what they um, would like to hear more on on this top topic of suggestions. So uh, that's an open invitation. Awesome. That's really good to hear. And I, 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 went, I was doing a lot of uh, reading on you before this, and I think there's just a, a swath of information in there, and it really – it's just insightful. I think it's just a read that everyone should have a read and take a look at because I didn't know a lot of the things you mentioned in there about the transition that the energy industry has taken over time. And it's really un it's really fascinating to find out um, how that story has unfolded and where we are, where we um, you know, where we've been, where we are and where we're going to. And um, I, I think it's important to, to understand exactly um, where we are going to because as a growing population, as demand of energy goes up, um, I think people need to hopefully be aware of that. So um, I'll, I'll definitely link it in the description below. And finally, um, I know that you are obviously on Forbes as a contributor, but for people to get in contact with you, um, what's the best way that people can either look up Power Ledger or just get in contact with you directly? Yeah, yeah I'm on LinkedIn. Um, that's the easiest way. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll, I'll put all the details into the description. Hopefully, uh, people will get a real kick out of this interview because I think it really showcases a lot of the stuff um, that people don't really know about, but I think people are fascinated by because it incorporates so many things, not of just about energy, about blockchain, um, about um, energy markets. So I hope that uh, you guys are going to continue growing up and, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll touch base in the next year or so and see how things are going. But it's really been uh, fascinating to, to hear you speak, Gemma. So, so thank you again for uh, coming on the, on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you.